was like 2011 or 2010, for the Washoe Park Foundation. They had hired a um, consulting firm. They were looking at doing some improvements in Washoe Park and Hefner's, and at Hefner's Dam, which is just a little ways further upstream on, on uh, Warm Springs Creek. And they wanted to have some historical information about the park to provide a good foundation for um, some of the improvements that they wanted to make. So they hired me to do that work. And I was extremely excited about the project because I always like to do local research, but also because um, I love Washoe Park and I love Anaconda. And so the opportunity to work in Washoe Park and Anaconda was just really exciting for me. Um, Washoe Park was a place that when my kids were little, I liked to go there because of the big deciduous trees and uh, cool creek running through there. I think it's, um, it was just such a cool oasis to go and hang out with. Being from you know, Nebraska where we had trees and lots of trees and water, maybe not so much water, but trees, <laughs> deciduous trees instead of just um, conifers, I, it, it just reminded me of home. But I realized as I did this research, that's what made, always has made Washoe Park such an inviting place to, um, for the, you know, probably way back in prehistoric times. So anyway, I would like to thank the Washoe Foundation for hiring me to do that work. It was a great project. Um, uh, most of the photographs that you'll see today, I got from the Marcus Daly archives of the Copper Village in Anaconda, and from the um, Hearst Public Library in Anaconda. I did take a few out of the newspapers, and you'll be able to tell those because they're grainier than the other ones, so you'll just have to sharpen your eyes when you see those. So to start off, I thought I'd just give you a little orientation. I, I, I assume, how many, is there anybody here that's never been to Washoe Park? Oh. <laughs> you'll have to go. Washoe Park is Anaconda, Butte sister city, 26 miles away to the northwest. Um, this is the, this is Anaconda. This is Washoe Park. It's kind of the northwest end when it was constructed. First used, Anaconda was pretty generally limited to here, so it was at the far northwest end of Anaconda. The um, green works that you see over there, that's where the lower and the upper works, the smelter site is. And so the park is locked right along Warm Springs Creek, which runs at the base of some very steep hills on the north side. So there's, there's the north side, and then the south side's more open level um, lands, bottom lands, heavily wooded. They were heavily wooded naturally. And then later on, trees were planted during the park's development. So it, it still is a beautiful spot as it was a long time ago. I did want to, I put a little red circle about on a place that's called Point of the Rocks. And that's a place on the north side of the creek where the, um, the rocks, the, the rocky slope on the north side of the creek comes down almost to the creek. And it's, I did that because we have some beautiful pictures that were overviews of the park that were taken for that point. So I just wanted to, if you could kind of remember that. I just had a start from the beginning of a disclaimer. I, I never wanted this talk to be a comparison between Butte's Columbia Gardens and Anaconda's Washoe Park. There was lots of similar, similarities in the reasoning for their development and such, but you know, Washoe Park was just never had, was never a mechanized park. There was never a roller coaster. There was never, you know, all, all, all the rides and stuff that you had at Washoe Park. You know, there just never was the huge investment that was made, um, that Clark made into making um, Columbia Gardens this really anomaly <laughs> in, the, in the American culture of a huge um, um, amusement park that was free to the public. So I just wanted to be, there are some similarities and some comparisons that can be made, but I just 
I, I, I didn't want to ever get into that because Washoe Park, it's just a great place in and of itself. And so that's what I want to concentrate my talk on. So the use of Washoe Park, you know, probably prehistoric people, I'm sure, camped out there. We don't have any evidence of that. But, um, you know, Warm Springs Creek was one of the earliest places settled in this part of the country. Um, as you know, like, it was part of the Deer Lodge Valley. Um, the Grant Coors brothers and all those guys settled up, Johnny Grant, up in Deer Lodge Valley in the late 1850s. By the early 1860s, um, farmers had moved down into the um, Warm, Scre Warm Spring Creek Valley, including a Scottish immigrant by the name of Alexander Glover. And in, I think he settled there probably about 1865 along the creek. And I, I, I had to put a little yellow mark around where his log cabin was built, and here's a kind of faded picture of it for you to see. But he built a cabin there, and that um, is in what is now the western part of Washoe Creek, and that building is still standing there. And so that's really exciting mm. because it's certainly the oldest building in Anaconda, and one of the oldest buildings in the state of Montana. And so Anaconda should be really proud of that. I really believe that that cabin its location in the park is its original location. Certainly it was originally built within the bounds of today's park. It may have been moved a little bit, but I look at land and you look at the northwest quarter, of the northwest it's the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter of the southeast quarter of section four township. <laughs> and that's where that building appears on the plat map. Now, Glover settled there in 1865, maybe built that cabin that same year. He um, probably, like other ranchers in the area, was a subsistence farmer. He raised a few head of cattle, irrigated hay maybe, some potatoes, maybe had a little vegetable garden. Um, and then he settled there, but he couldn't claim the land like the other homesteaders until 1876 when the General Land Office came out and did a survey. And this map is of their survey, the map up here. That was done in 1876. I added some coloring to highlight it. <laughs> the coloring of the blue is uh, Warm Springs Creek. And then I, I highlighted Glover's Cabin um, in, in yellow. And when the General Land Office came out, they imposed a, a six by six mile grid. They did that all over the country and they created townships and sections and quarter sections. And they provided the, um, the basis so we can make legal descriptions so we can lay claim to land. And that happened in 1876. And then um, Glover went in and he claimed the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter, which is now the western part of Washoe Creek. Um, the surveyors, they did some great things, not always, but they would plot the location of houses that were there, and those are the little black dots you can see around. They put in, on this map, they put in fences, they're little squiggly lines, and you can see a squiggly line around um, Glover's cabin. And, you know, he probably had a garden there that he wanted to keep his cattle and deer and other wildlife out of. Um, one of his neighbors down the way had a vineyard. I don't, I don't think you can probably decipher that from back there, but that's, I think, pretty interesting to think. In 1876, wow. somebody was growing grapes and making yeah. wine along Warm, Warm Springs Creek. But these guys, you know, they led a pretty idyllic, maybe it wasn't idyllic, I'm sure it was harsh, but they led a you know, rural life on their own in this beautiful valley until the early 1880s when we all know that Marcus Daly um, started to look for a place to big, uh, build a brand new smelter to reduce the copper ores from the Anaconda mine in Anaconda. He was doing that in conjunction with, as a representative of William Hurst and a bunch of other really rich men from San Francisco. Um, Marcus Daly had the foresight back then to know that, you know, Butte had really, really rich copper, or copper prices were booming because they were starting to electrify the United States. 
And um, you know, he he had the gumption and intuition to know that he was onto something big. Water was a real problem here in Butte, as you know. We had several smelters already by the late 1870s down along um, Silver Bow Creek. Um, water is essential for the processes that are involved in ore reduction. There was just no place really to build over here, and the water that was here was already polluted. So he looked 26 miles to the northwest, and to what we call Anaconda today, and saw Warm Creek, Springs Creek, saw you know all this fresh water pouring out of the mountains, and he thought that was an ideal location to build his new smelter. So uh, he came in. Uh, he hired um, Evans. I can't remember. L O Evans. L O. What? L O Evans. No, not L O Evans. Oh. Works with M. Morgan. 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 <laughs> to go to buy land and secure water rights. And that's what he did. And he bought that, that land you see along there. That's um, you know, some of the land that he bought, including um, Glover's cabin site. But about a mile down there is where he bought the site to build his smelter, the first smelter that what became known as the Upper Works. Um, and so he bought Glover's land um, in section, if you can see there's section two, two and three is where he, then he platted the Anaconda town site to provide a, t a place for his smelter workers to live. And that really radically changed the, the local environment. And here's a picture of the Upper Works. I don't know, probably not when it was first built, but at some time. You can see it was on the north side of the creek. It was against the hillside there. So as the 1880s went on and Anaconda was booming, um, the new town site did not extend into what we call Washoe Park today. Um, there was, they built the railroad right south of there between the town, kind of north and south north and south of the park and north of the town. Um, but where Glover lived and the land just a little downstream was open and it was <coughs> wooded and, and people started to go there and have picnics. So it became a popular picnic ground in the 1880s. In the late 1880s, they started to have some formal picnics there and they started to call it Anaconda's Picnic Grounds. And, um, Let's see, I, I had a quote I wanted to read. Of course, I never. So in um, one of the big picnics they had in the summer of 1899 was proved to be the largest social gathering that they ever had in Anaconda yet. It was a picnic hosted by the ancient Hibernian orders and other Irish organizations in Anaconda and Butte. And it was held on June 26th, and three to 4,000 people attended wow. that picnic. So that, that was pretty wow. substantial. And it included, and among there were 14 train loads of Butte Irish. Wow. So, wow. <laughs> so um, less than a week later, they had, they had a, um, the um, Fourth of July celebration there, and that was also a big deal. They had a, a band that came, um, excuse me, the Boston and Montana band mm -hmm. from the Boston and Montana Smelter and Butte came, and they, along with the Smelter City Fife and Drum Corps, led the parade through the city, and then they went to the to the new grounds and um, or to these grounds, and they had a huge picnic, and they had foot races and they chased pigs and they had a grease pole and they played baseball and then they had fireworks that night. So that really set the stage for the idea that this would be a great place for a park. And Marcus Daly decided that would be okay and so in 1889, I mean 1890, he donated 35 acres at Washoe Park to be developed into a park. And that became what we now know today as Anaconda. Park. It was the predecessor to today's Washoe Park. 
Um, and here are the only documentation um, imagery that I have of that park. And this one is out of the newspaper, so it's, it's, it's very grainy. So you can look at this map here. And what they did is they built a dam and they made a little lake. And so we have this lake here. And then first of all, they built a pavilion. And later on, they added uh, a clubhouse in the pavilion is where they could have held dances. And the clubhouse had a little gymnasium where they could do things. And then these buildings down here, I think, were, um, um, the, where the Glover cabin was located. And you may have had more than one building down there. This photo was taken from where that black arrow is. And I don't know if you can see through there, but you can sort of see some buildings in the trees that are the clubhouse and, and the pavilion. And so this also became a, you know, it became a very, very popular place for people in Anaconda to have picnics. And back then, all kinds, of, that was a big thing for organizations. We had a lot of organizations, and having a summer event was huge, both in Anaconda and in Butte. You had the, you know, like the ancient orders of Hiberians, the miners, Union organizations, churches, um, Sunday schools, the clerks and butchers union would have picnics there. So it became a very, very popular place. It was also kind of a wild place. Um, the pavilion, they sold liquor, and uh, women weren't supposed to be around <coughs> alcohol at that time, and so they got, women and children so got crazy. kind of kicked out of the pavilion, and it was, <laughs> And then there was lots of trouble with the police coming down there. Um, so that's when they built the, the clubhouse. And they made a gymnasium in the clubhouse. And they kind of made the clubhouse the men's place. And then the pavilion had a, um, a lemonade stand and some other things that made it more agreeable to women and children. But this place was very popular. Um, it had some problems, though. The lake often would not fill in the summer or would, they couldn't get much water. And that's because the water was being diverted upstream for use downstream at the smelter. Um, Mitzi and I might disagree on the ends about it when things was built, but they did establish a reservoir early on um, above, about a, a mile or so upstream is called Hefner's Reservoir. And kind of people probably know that because your trail leads there now. And that's where they diverted water out of Warm Springs Creek and then held it there and released it as it was needed for the smelter. There was a pipe that it would feed into. And what I believe is that the pipe carried the water down downstream to the point of the rocks at the west end of today's Washoe Park. And then somehow or other it went into a flume and it was called the low line flume. It was a low flume and it, and it took it down there. And so they diverted past the um, lake and when they needed lots of water, and as you know, they just kept growing and growing. They added the, um, the lower works. They had a new smelter so you had a much bigger complex. They were using all that water for uh, the smelter and so it, it just wasn't that successful. It, it, people still used it. But then in about 1900, the Anaconda Company decided that they were going to build a new park for the people of Anaconda. And that probably had something to do with the fact that in 1899 is when Clark purchased what had been what became his Columbia Gardens. There had been a little park amusement area there, and he purchased it in 1899. And you know, started his big amusement park. So this new park was um, Mountain View, and it was about, I'm not really sure, four or six miles further up the valley. And they built a lake there, and they built all these amenities, a great big ball field. And they built a spur line of the Butte Anaconda Railway, which connected Butte and Anaconda, to this new park. And I'm sure they were thinking that they were going to make money off of people riding the train up to the park. Because that's actually how Columbia Gardens worked, is they made money, they let people in for free, but you had to pay 
to ride the streetcar. There was days when it was free. For the most part, you had to pay to ride there so that the streetcar division would make money. In Anaconda, the BAMP is making money, the Anaconda Company is making money. So they built that park in um, 1890, and they just, but it, but it failed. Um, I guess Anaconda people just weren't interested in taking the train up there and paying to go there. So it, it was only open for a few years, and then Anaconda people didn't have a park. And that lasted until 1906. And there's lots of reasons for that. In the meantime, the Anaconda Company started to build. Oops, I got some. But they started to build the um, new Washoe smelter on the south side of the creek. Um, and in conjunction with that, they knew they had to get a whole lot more water. They just started to build a much bigger, more complex water diversion and collection facility up. Um, Warm Springs Creek, including um, Silver Lake. They developed that into a huge reservoir. They, they, they collected water from all around into that reservoir. Then they loomed or piped it down to Myers Dam, which was another reservoir. And at Myers Dam, they settled the water. And then they put it into a flume, a flume that took the water to the new smelter on the south side of the creek. So. In doing that, they re that was all on the south side of the creek where Washoe, the old smelters, and the Washoe Park was on the north side of the creek. They were able to retire Hefner's Dam and free up some of the water to come back to downstream, so they um, to the Washoe Park area. So that was a benefit. So you know, then you have the Battle of the Copper Kings and all that, blah, blah, blah. And that ended in 1906. And that's when the Anaconda Company decided to really make some new improvements in the Anaconda for the people of Anaconda. That's when they donated the land for the commons, which is a big square park still in Anaconda today, where people do what they did back then and go ice skating, which is really wonderful. And they um, reinvested in um, developments at the old Anaconda Park, and they named it after the new smelter, naming it Washoe Park. And I'm going to go back a little bit. The Anaconda Park and Washoe Park, you know, the construction and use of this park was part of a huge movement in the nation in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, that was this ideal that cities needed to have parks where urban dwellers and working class people could go and have a place to relax, to get away from the hustle bustle of life, and to, you know, enjoy nature. It was a very romantic notion that people should be able to go out and be in this idyllic nature-like setting, and that they would be happier and work better if they, they had such amenities. And really the first major romantic urban park that we had was Central Park in New York. And that was the product of um, Frank, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted and his associate Bo, I can't remember what it is, Claude Bo. And they're the ones that can, they really promoted this romantic concept of you know, taking advantage of nature. And so I just wanted to put this in. Um, this is a picture showing um, um, Central Park under construction. They made a big lake, all these trails that wound around through woods and you know stuff like that. Here's a later version of it showing its scenic beauty. I think it's really interesting to note though when they built to build Central Park, this place was already settled. There was huge black and Irish communities there. There was towns. And they just took it away in eminent domain and wiped them out. So it wasn't all that idyllic. But certainly those concepts translated into park developments all around the country. Um, Olmsted, he, he developed parks in 30 major cities in the United States. His sons were landscape architects well and the, as well, and they carried on the tradition. 
I think almost every city and every town in the United States, if they have a scenic park, they think that it was designed by the Olmsted brothers, and that was certainly something I, I hoped for, but I could never find for the Anaconda Park, so, <laughs> or for Washoe Park, but they certainly um, took on those ideals. So they started construction in 1906. Um, the Anaconda Company turned the um, construction of the park over to, I think it was, to the streetcar foreman. And I'll, I'll go into that a little while later. But, you know, they, they, they went, they took some of the things that they had done before at the old Anaconda Park. They built another lake. They built a dam to create a lake. It was a much bigger lake. Um, they also did a lot of plantings and trees, and they did a dance pavilion, and then they had a ball field, but they greatly expanded the grounds. They added um, many more acres to it, especially to the west, well, to the west and to the east. And they bought the land, and they, and they included the land that was the old Glover cabin into that new park. And they incorporated use of the Glover cabin um, as a night for a night watchman's place, so they, they included that. So That's nice. if you ever go to Washoe Park, make mm -hmm. sure you notice that really important historic building. So here's a picture I wanted to show you, and this is in 1907, when the grounds were still pretty new. Um, it is taken from that point of rock, so it's taken from the northwest corner, looking, looking southeast. You can see the dance pavilion up there. And then, and then you can see the creek milling through. There isn't a lot of trees. It doesn't look all that inviting, but it quickly grew. And um, this is also taken from the point of the rocks. Here's the pavilion. Um, here's the big lake. There was an art, they called it an artificial island um, in the middle of the lake. There's a bridge that connected it. Then they had this huge grounds out here with all these pathways through it. They planted, um, at one time, in one season, they planted 240 poplar trees oh, wow. in, in the park. And that's just one summer that I found they did that. They might have done that mm -hmm. more. So they really improved the grounds a lot, made it a lot bigger, and it was a much more spectacular park than the old Anaconda Park. So the lake was really the center of the park. Um, they had rowboats that people could rent. And, and roll around the lake. They had had those on the, at Anaconda Park, and they certainly had them in Mountain View. Um, and then they, they stocked it with swans and geese. Uh, the swans they brought, the first ones they brought down, I believe, were from Red Rocks Lake mm -hmm. in the Centennial Mountains mm -hmm. above Lima, which I think is pretty interesting. They went up there and captured something that we really try to protect hard today. Uh, but that, you know, so that, that was really great for kids to come. That, when you read the paper, that was a big thing, it was to go feed the swans in the lake, which is a tradition that's being carried out again today. That I don't think there's any swans in the new pond that they have there, but there's lots of geese and different birds, and so it's a really enjoyable place for children to come. And then there was the pavilion. The pavilion was built in 19, completed in 1907. And it was, I think, 60 feet wide by 180 feet long. It had maple floors. And at the time, it was, they proudly announced, it was five feet longer than the pavilion at the Columbia Gardens. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first pavilion at the Columbia Gardens, and it burned down not too much longer, and they built a new one. So it, that, that distinction is being larger than the It didn't last that long. But it was a place where they'd have, they'd have orchestras and bands that come, and they'd have dances. It also could be used for um, games. They could play games inside, I, you know, Rock, not racquetball, I don't know, whatever games they were playing back then, inside games. It had a, a, a porch, an open porch that went all the way around. If you look at that top picture, you can see the front of the building facing the lake uh, on that roof of the porch, so it was a balcony. And they used that in, in the summertime, bands would set up on that balcony, and then people could be outside and listen to um, the sound of the music. And the design of the building, it was kind of a rustic style design, which is really in keeping with the romantic character of the park. 
here there was speeches. I can't. I think this was. I can't remember. Somebody famous was giving a speech here, and I feel terrible that I didn't. Can't remember. I did this research so long ago, but it was a place where people would come for events like that. Of course, the ball field. The ball field well, he was next to the pavilion, and the lake was the center of the park. The top picture is an early picture, and it's out of a newspaper, and so it's grainy, but you can see people are just standing around the ball field. It was just to the west of the pavilion, south of the lake, to the west of the pavilion, and people are just standing there watching the ball game. Later on, this picture's from 1923, they put a fence around and added, um, <coughs> added uh, uh, leechers, or whatever you call those things, and people could come in and sit and enjoy, so it became a little bit better. But, you know, Butte and Anaconda had a strong rivalry in their ball team teams, but you know, every city in Montana back then practically had a team and they would play each other, and they were big events. They were big events for the picnics as well. The, you know, the but Clerk and Butcher's Union might have a ball team and they would pl play the, um, the miners' unions or something like that. So it, it was a big deal and it brought lots of people to the park. Um, in conjunction with development of the park, Anaconda Company, or, or the Street Railway Company, which was all Anaconda Company, they extended a uh, street line to the park so people could get there easier. And they also, as I read, they extended Park Street West so people could get to the park as well. And as I say, it was part of this thing to encourage people to use the park, and, but people would have to pay a little bit to take the street, street car from downtown Anaconda, the mile or so, to the west end of the park, which was the main entry back then. And so that's one way they made a little money. They also made their money by um, renting the park for picnics and other events in the summer. That's how they, they made a lot of their money. And that was the job, initially, of the street railroad, the head of the street railroad. He was one for going out and finding people to, um, to help hold events there. I don't think he had much trouble for several years, and, and so they, they did quite well. But one of the things that I really loved about this whole thing the most was to see that the bridges that they added to the park. They were spectacular. They were beautiful. They were distinctive. Mm -hmm. And they made Washoe Park just this wonderful, special place. Um, they had, when they first developed it in 1906 07, they built two road bridges and I believe six pedestrian bridges. This is one of the pedestrian bridges, and it was probably the most picturesque bridge in, in the whole park. It, um, carried, it, it connected the main roadway with the artificial, with the island. People would mm. cross that bridge to go to the island. Um, you know, they, all the bridges were very rustic in character. They used you know, tree limbs, um, willow bark, or willow or whatever, to to make yeah, these really nice. fanciful um, decorative bridges. This one has really arched unique. up so that the boats could go underneath it. And they called it often the Japanese bridge. <laughs> and I think it was probably one of the most, it, w it was where people took, had their picture taken. It was one of the most photogenic sites in town. I've done research on some other families, like family in Rocker, and they didn't have the original pictures, but they had Xerox photographs showing their family on this bridge, which I think is, is really unique. Here, you can see it's up there in this photograph there where it connects um, to the island. It's really cool. And these bridges, this is one that was in, um, this wasn't at Washoe Park, this was in I was gonna say. Central Park. It's yeah, a wrought iron bridge. Beautiful. But these really decorative, ornamental that's bridges were were one of the hallmarks of these romantic parks. And they had, I think they built, the, when they first built Central Park, they built 32. And a lot of them were like wrought iron out of this. Washington Park didn't have wrought iron. But they had a variety of other kinds. Here's another, this is another very scenic little bridge. I don't know exactly where it was. It was kind of probably maybe um, upstream of the lake somewhere, just across the creek. Um, this 
this, these, this is the same bridge, and it, this was up toward the west end of the park. And then here's one of the major road bridges. You can see there's a, you guys know what car that is, but it, it connected, um, there was a roadway that went through the central part of the park, and there it is up there, you can see it. So it was an important bridge, but it's still, it was, a, it was a pony truss bridge, but they added the um, decorative um, rustic railings onto it to make it fit in with the rest of the park. Some of the other things they did at the right below um, Point of the Rocks is where a natural spring pops out of the mountains, and they, and they made that. They dug it out and made it into a pond and ducks and stuff would, were stocked in there, and that's something that's still in Washoe Park today. Another thing they did is they built a bridge across the Point of the Rocks. Now, this is a very grainy photograph. I wish it was better, but the Point of the Rocks is this right here. It was this rock intrusion that came all the way down to the creek. And when the Anaconda Company built the railroad to the upper works in 1883 or 84, they blasted through this rock, creating that road. And it left this, this big thing on the other side. And so when they developed Washoe Park, they built a stairway to go up that, and it led to that bridge, another rustic bridge, that bridged that, that gap that, that, um, over the railroad. And um, then it was this great opportunity for people to keep on walking up and go up into the hills above, above the park. And it was very, 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 very popular. Also, you can see in this is there's this another wood structure over here. And that's what we call the upper flume. And that was built, I believe, in like 1886 when they built the um, lower works. They added on to the upper works, built the lower works. This is all on the north side of the river. They retired that old low flume that I talked to you about, and they built this upper flume. And this upper flume took water from Hefner's Dam down to the works. And it was a visual landscape on, um, visual feature on Anaconda's landscape until the 1940s when it, it burned down. But you see it a lot in the pictures, and I wish I would have been is, around to see that. Is this road still there? Is that where we this, park no, at the western no, end? No, I'll show you. This rock, they okay. blasted this away. I'll show you. It's okay. not a very good picture, but this rock is gone. Okay. So too bad. So yeah. this isn't the this isn't the, the road entry. that I'm thinking of. At the west end? At the west end? end? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'll show you a picture. Okay. Of course, there's lots of snow on it, so it's not as graphic. But this was... This was the main entrance into Washoe Park for people okay. coming in. They were going through here. That, that flume up there is what they call the caves on a big cave. That's where that flume. Yeah, it went through the rock. It went through there's the rock. A, there's, yeah. there's two caves that go through. There's a, the big one you can see, and then there's a small one down below it that mm -hmm. I grew okay. up there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they also started a little zoo, which they also had, <laughs> you know, like they had at um, Columbia Gardens. The zoo, the first animals, I believe, were two little deer. And, uh, and then, <laughs> of course they, they added on, and this is this is from like 1907. This is the bear den. Yeah, and this is the bear in the den. <laughs> so this was the bear den, and then they started to build, um, so the point of the rocks would be right there, and then this pond, the hot springs pond and then this bear den. And this is on the north side of the creek at the far west end of the park. Um, and then, and then, again, this is, um, this is Point of the Rocks. This is the bridge that goes over the gap, which they call the Grand Canyon in some <laughs> literature. On the west side of that, and if you even Today, if you drive along the road, they call it Deer Pin Road, I think? Deer Park. Deer Park. Deer Park. Deer Park. And that's where they had the Deer Pin. Eventually, they added elk and buffalo to the pin. So it was, it was quite a thing. And then they added um, some buildings where they had, they had a link and a bobcat. The, um, 
the manager of the Columbia Gardens gave him, I think he gave him the bear. Excuse me, I should have mentioned that. But they built this, this co little complex of buildings over there where people could walk through and see animals and birds. And here's a picture of it in the 1920s. And if people that know Washoe Park will know that that building is still there today. So anyway, so the 1920s was the big decade for Washoe Park when it was, you know, at its peak. The trees were big and it was the most beautiful. Things started to change a little bit. In, well, one thing that did happen in the 1920s is they decided to introduce swimming. And they said they had a pond, and I believe it was someplace in the creek that may have been just a little downstream of the lake. And the city of Anaconda started to donate swimsuits to kids so they could go swimming in this pond and have lessons. If you look at that picture closely and you look at those kids' faces, I mean, it's they miserable. Kind of They're scary. freezing yeah, I was cold. Say that. <laughs> yeah, they don't look too happy. I love this picture, though. So that's, that's Anaconda's yeah. first swimming pool. Wow. <laughs> And now we go over there. But as time went on yeah, in the 1930s, exactly. they decided they needed to have a pool. And, you know, that was the Depression. And we had the workers, the WPA program, the federal government, where they, you know, they gave money to projects that put people to work. And so Anaconda got some money to do some improvements in Washoe Park. And they built the first concrete swimming pool in Washoe Park. And then with that, they built a, a rustic log dress house, change house. And that building's still there today. The pool's different, but if you all know Washoe Park, you know that building's still there. Then in the 40s, they hired um, a new guy to help with plantings. And his, and his wife helped him. His name was Ed Pickle, and his wife was Cora. And he had been the um, head gardener or forester for the Anaconda Company. And he took that job very seriously. He loved begonias. And he built this begonia house. And that's gorgeous. something that's still standing today. I don't have a full photograph of it historically. But I love this because it shows it's a historic photograph with the begonias in the house. Yeah, that's awesome. And the boardwalk's still there, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and then they also, he also built a green, established a greenhouse on the north side of the creek over by um, the zoo. And they just planted wow. Washington Park up. And it was beautiful. So you can see there's the Begonia House with these huge, beautiful gardens. And then here we are over at, um, this is that, the Warm Spring Pond. That's part of the... Um, point of the rocks on the north side of the creek. And they, they I believe, worked in Washoe Park into the 60s and made it beautiful every summer. It, I think it, I don't know if any of you remember being there mm -hmm. and seeing all those beautiful flowers and gardens. It was pretty spectacular. Didn't they have a, they have a fish hatchery? The fish hatchery, the fish hatchery is still there. It's. Mm -hmm. It's downstream of Washington Park just a little bit. Um, it's, on, it's, um, it's run by the state. And it originally did start out as part of the park. But, and it's still there. I didn't include it because it's not part of the park today. And it really wasn't, you know, it, it, it's a fish hatchery. But it's still there today. And a lot of the original buildings are still there today. And so that's just an added bonus if you go over to see Washington Park to go to the fish hatchery. The big change came in the late 40s when the Anaconda Company decided that Washington Park needed, or Anaconda needed a new ball field. And so to make this new ball field, they took out the lake. They pulled out the dam and they built this new ball field. So where y'all from Anaconda know where that ball field is, that is, took up, took up the lake. I, was, I know I've seen part of the dam. I know where the dam is. You can find a little bits of it. And I wanted to take a picture of you to show that you that. But, but this was a time, especially in the late 40s and early 50s, when things 
started to change a little bit. Um, people, you know, it's a suburbanization era when people started having bigger yards and, you know, Anaconda was moving west <laughs> and new housing developments and people were having bigger yards and parks just weren't as popular as they were. And so, you know, it slowly just, I, w I don't want to say decline, but maybe they just didn't put so much effort into um, making it a spectacular place. Maybe not as many picnics, although I bet there still was a lot of picnics mm -hmm. there in the summer. But, um, so that's, that's where I'm ending, because I don't want to talk about some of the other stuff that's gone in there since, since then. But I wanted to show you, this, this is the point of the rocks, and this is a terrible picture, I know, because I just went out and took it, and it's in the snow. So this, this, is that, this is the blasted rock. It wouldn't be that big rock there if they blasted it down. It's just mm. this little chunk. So when you're going in from the west, there's a bridge. You know, all, all of the um, decorative rustic bridges, timber bridges were removed probably during the 30s or 40s. Um, and so you can see that that landmark is still there. This is the rocked pond around the Warm Springs, and it's still there. It's on the north side of the creek, just on the other side of Point of the Rocks. This is the WPA change house that they built at the first swimming pool.